Good morning. I'm Cindy Aronson, the director of the Latin American program. And on behalf of the Latin American program and the Mexico Institute here, represented by my colleague, Andrew Rudman, the new director of the Mexico Institute, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's discussion of US counter narcotics policy in the Western hemisphere. In 2019, members of Congress, um, members of the congressionally mandated Western Hemisphere Drug Policy Commission were sworn in several years after Congress created the commission. And their goal was to conduct a comprehensive review of US policies in Latin America to reduce the illicit supply and drug abuse and reduce the damage associated with Ill illicit drug markets and trafficking. The commission was also charged with recommending and identifying policy options for improving counter narcotics policy. Behind that initiative was and is a sobering reality. In the last decade, over half a million people in the United States have died of drug overdoses and drug related violence in Mexico, Colombia and Central America is rampant if not increasing. And drug production in Latin America remains at historically high levels. The commission's December 2020 report called attention to a number of important policy successes, criminal justice reforms in Mexico, the strengthening of anti-money uh, laundering regulations, alternative development programs in coca growing regions of Colombia and increased funding for substance abuse prevention and treatment here at home. But the commission also underscored some persistent failings. These included the faltering of anti-corruption efforts in Central America's Northern Triangle, the increase um, and persistence of coca cultivation in Colombia, and record numbers, sadly, of drug-related homicides in Mexico. We're honored to welcome today a number of the members of the Western Hemisphere Drug Policy Commission, along with two distinguished scholars and practitioners from Colombia and Mexico who will comment on the report. Leading off will be General Douglas Frazier, a 37-year veteran of the United States Air Force. His last assignment in the US Armed Forces was as commander of the US Southern Command which is responsible for US military operations in Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. Next will be Mary Speck, the executive director of the Western Hemisphere Drug Policy Commission. Prior to serving in that role, among her many positions, Mary headed the Central America and Mexico team of the International Crisis Group. Um, conducting research into organized crime, corruption, and security sector reform. She also worked as a journalist, which is where I first met her, covering the Andean region as a, as a correspondent for the Miami Herald. Following Mary will be Alejandro Jope, who joins us again. Thank you, Alejandro. He is a security consultant and partner at the Grupo de Economistas y Asociados, a Mexico City-based consulting firm. Alejandro has held several executive positions in Mexico's civilian intelligence agency, CISEN, and is truly one of Mexico's most distinguished security analysts. Finally, will be Daniel Mejia, an economics professor at the Universidad de los Andes in Colombia and former director of the university's uh, Center for Studies on Security and Drugs. Danielle has written widely on counter drug policy and also served as secretary of security for the capital city of Bogota. So without further ado, I invite General Frazier to unmute um, and he will begin if you have questions that you'd like to direct to any of our panelists, please send them via our Twitter account at LATAMPROG, L-A-T-A-M-P-R-O-G, and we'll be happy to take your questions later in the program. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you today and to discuss the key findings from the congressionally mandated Western Hemisphere Drug Policy Commission. So thank you for your introduction. 
and to the Wilson Center for providing us an opportunity to discuss the commission's findings. I'm also pleased to be joined by Mary Speck, who we have spent the last year and a half uh, corresponding uh, frequently with, uh, and to uh, Daniel Mejia and Alejandro Obe uh, in this discussion. I also want to acknowledge and thank Congressman Elliot Engel, the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee for his enduring leadership on this issue throughout his time serving in Congress. As you stated, Cindy, the commission began its work in May of 2019 with a two-fold charter. Evaluate U.S. counter-narcotics programs in America, in the Americas, and to make recommendations to improve them. While our mandate focused on drug control policy within the Western Hemisphere, the commission recognized that drug control policy is linked to both the demand for drugs in the United States and U.S. drug control policy around the world. The commission also recognized that the production, transfer, and sale of illicit drugs throughout the Western Hemisphere is conducted by transnational criminal organizations operating illicit networks across the hemisphere that connect to uh, illicit networks in the United States and other parts of the globe. U.S. drug policy, therefore, in my view, must empower U.S. government agencies to integrate a network of national, state, local agencies with international organizations to counter these criminal networks. Transnational criminal organizations are learning organizations. They adapt to changes in government policy and enforcement. To meet these challenges, government drug control policy must be equally adaptable and flexible. This said, no single policy will address the regional or global illegal drug problem in its totality. As I stated earlier, policy solutions must be flexible, adaptable, and enduring to meet the complexity of the problem and the need to coordinate policy with multiple government agencies and with our international partners. Fundamentally, the goal of US policy is reducing the supply of illicit drugs by helping partner governments in Latin America, reduce the ability of transnational criminal organizations to operate within their borders and work with their neighbors to reduce the abilities of the organizations to operate regionally. US drug control policy in the Western hemisphere also must work with demand reduction policy uh, in the United States. U.S. drug policy must actively manage this relationship. Finally, I think it's important to recognize the progress of U.S. drug policy in the Western Hemisphere during the last couple of decades. U.S. government organizations working with regional governments have adapted to changes in transnational criminal activities, have adjusted programs to meet changing conditions in the region, and have worked with partner nation governments uh, to enhance cooperation and improve policies and programs. We should also recognize that adequate funding combined with rigorous assessments enable the successful implementation of drug control policy. Better resourcing and assessments, not only in the US government, but with our partners in the region will improve policy success. The commission recognizes these realities and the need for continuing government focus. The commission made the following uh, big recommendations in addition to what you stated earlier. Now first, empower the State Department to develop and coordinate a whole of government effort to counter transnational criminal organizations and reduce the supply of illicit drugs to the US. The Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs should work with all relevant US government agencies and departments to develop and implement a coherent five-year strategy. Move the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, INL, under political affairs, and give the State Department long-term flexible funding authorities to prevent, adjust to, and contain existing and emerging transnational criminal threats. This recommendation puts one government organization, the Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs, in charge of directing, developing, and coordinating U.S. drug policy for the Western Hemisphere and the rest of the globe. This recommendation also gives political affairs more flexibility and authority to put resources where they are needed to address changes in transnational criminal activities. Second, the commission recommended the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs develop compact-based counter-narcotics and law enforcement assistance programs empower U.S. ambassadors to fashion foreign assistance compacts based on the model used by the, uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation. 
identified shared goals for combating organized crime, strengthen criminal justice programs, and protect citizen security and human rights. This recommendation empowers U.S. ambassadors working with host nations to build mutual programs in which both sides understand their responsibilities and work cooperatively to counter transnational criminal organizations and their activities. The Undersecretary of Political Affairs, working with U.S. ambassadors and governments, can also coordinate policies uh, between neighboring countries to implement effective regional programs to counter regional criminal organization activities and efforts. Third, the Commission recommended the White House Office of National Drug Policy, ONDCP, be reoriented to evaluate both domestic and foreign narcotics efforts through clearly defined benchmarks and data-driven evaluations. ONDCP should develop long, medium, and short-term supply and control uh, performance metrics focused on its primary objective, saving lives, and evaluate second and third order effects of drug trafficking and law enforcement efforts. This recommendation recognizes the important role ONDCP plays in monitoring U.S. counter-narcotics policy and the critical linkage between domestic and foreign counter-narcotics policy. It also changes the role of ONDCP. The view of the commission was that ONDCP was never able to perform its critical lead role because it was never given the policy nor funding authority to fill its, fulfill its mandate. The commission also recognized the value of, that the value ONDCP provides the White House through its oversight of both domestic and foreign counter narcotics programs and its independent position and role within the government. Fourth, the commission recommended strengthening the US Treasury Department's capacity to investigate illicit financial flows, provide additional resources to, the, to Treasury's financial crimes enforcement network to enhance its ability to investigate money laundering and other financial crimes and improve the efficiency and the quality of financial reporting with the private sector. The commission recognized the increasing role money laundering plays in enabling transnational criminal organizations activities and the need to increase US government capability to counter this problem. Fifth and finally, the commission recommended replacing the US State Department's drug certification and designation process with more effective tools. The commission determined that the drugs certification and designation process was not achieving its goals. Uh, the commission thinks effective tools are available and recommends the Congress direct a review of the certification and designation process and recommend changes as appropriate. The commission recognizes the progress made uh, by the US through its counter narcotic efforts. But the commission also understands that criminal organizations will continue drug trafficking throughout the Western Hemisphere and will continue to exploit vulnerable partner nation governments and populations. Commission recommendations therefore focus uh, on providing US counter narcotics policy and the government organizations that implement this policy with the flexibility they need to stay in front of these criminal organizations operations. Cooperation between US government and its partners across the Western Hemisphere remains a critical, uh, remains critical to countering criminal organizations, enhancing citizen security and saving lives. Finally, the commission recognizes that the fight against transnational criminal organizations must be an enduring policy focus and requires sustained commitment. US policy must give government agencies the flexibility, resources and support needed to win this fight. So thank you for my opportunity to discuss the commission's uh, reports and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, General Frazier. Mary Speck, uh, Executive Director of the Commission. Here we go. Um, first, I'd like to join General Frazier in thanking uh, the Wilson Institute, Cindy and Andrew, and of course, our commentators, uh, Alejandro and Daniel. Um, the question posed for this webinar was, is U.S. counter-narcotics policy working? Has it fulfilled its fundamental objective, which is protecting lives from both drug abuse and the violence associated with drug trafficking? And the short answer is obviously no. Fatal overdoses, as Cindy pointed out, appear in the U.S. appear likely to break another record in 2020. 
homicides remain at record or near record levels in Mexico and in many of the drug transit countries, particularly in the Caribbean. Meanwhile, the production and flow of illicit drugs continues. Colombian coca cultivation has reached record levels in recent years, despite massive eradication. And highly toxic synthetic substances are either replacing or being combined with traditional plant-based drugs. Fentanyl, much of which arrives via Mexico, is associated with most of the fatal overdoses registered in the US. But the long answer about, uh, to the question about US supply control policies is more complicated. There are no simple solutions, no shortcuts to countering Ill illicit drug trafficking or more broadly, the organized transnational criminal activity that threatens lives in both the US and Latin America. Traditional counter narcotics tools, interdiction and eradication are necessary, but grossly insufficient. Nonetheless, our report argues that some US policies show promising results. It argues, as General Frazier pointed out, that we need a comprehensive approach that is better managed in Washington and better targeted in Latin America. Over the long run, we must address the institutional vacuums, lack of security, justice, and economic opportunity that allow the illicit drug trafficking industry to thrive. What does this mean for foreign assistance? The WHDPC makes two fundamental suggestions about foreign aid, some of which, uh, which General Frazier already mentioned. It should be country-led based on bilateral compacts that outline the roles and responsibilities of both the US and the host government. It should be flexible so it can be modified and adapted based on rigorous evaluations. Now, very briefly, I wanna discuss the two countries that we're going to, that um, Alejandro and Danielle are going to discuss. Um, first, Colombia. What have we learned? That eradication is a tool, but not the only tool. Decades of experience tells us that producers quickly replant and or adapt new techniques and more productive varieties. Even if Colombia overcomes the legal hurdles to aerial fumigation, much of the crop is now located in protected areas, parks or indigenous reservations, where spraying would be either illegal or subject to local consultation. What has worked in the past? A more comprehensive approach such as the consolidation plan launched in 2007, most notably in La Macarena region of Meta Department. Such an approach first establishes security, including a police presence, adds quick impact projects to provide income and gain trust, such as building rural roads, and promotes sustainable investments, whether in agriculture or ecotourism. The key is to establish state presence, win local trust, and provide viable long-term alternatives to coca. Consolidation lost uh, momentum as the government focused on peace negotiations, but Colombia's current strategy replicates elements of the consolidation program. With US assistance, the government has targeted high risk, high poverty zones using integrated approaches designed to provide security, encourage local production and provide producers with financing and market access. Our report provides more detail, but I just wanna emphasize here a key component which is mandated in the 2016 peace agreement the local development plans known as PEDETs or territorially focused development plans. If carried out, they would be an unprecedented grassroots effort to transform regions with histories of conflict and poverty. The key obstacles as always are lack of funding and fading political will. Uh, Mexico. We published our report shortly after the US arrested and then released General Salvador Cienfuegos, the former Mexican Secretary of Defense. The arrest and Mexico's response to it, quickly exonerating the general of the drug charges, has deepened mutual distrust, potentially undermining one of the Merida Initiative's most important legacies, strong institutional relationships between the US and the Mexican government. In addition, AMLO at the start of his term dismantled the federal police, which had received substantial US support and training, replacing it with a new National Guard, which so far has expressed little or no interest in US assistance. So what can and should be salvaged from the Merida Initiative? Again, the commission urges the US and Mexico to negotiate a new joint strategy or compact with explicit roles and responsibilities on both sides. The commission did not recommend specific policies, but did suggest the US explore greater cooperation in the following areas. Criminal justice reform. Training and transparency can make a difference. Prisoner surveys, for example, suggest that under the new accusatory system, 
torture has decreased, judges are more attentive, and sentencing is clearer. Anti-corruption, especially within the security forces. This is one of AMLO's stated objectives. The US can help Mexico uh, develop better internal controls and support NGOs that offer external oversight, such as citizen observatories. State and local institutions plus civil society. The US needs to look beyond the federal government establishing new partnerships at the subnational level. For example, by providing state prosecutors with forensic technologies or local mayors with CompStat policing. Arms trafficking. Mexican criminal organizations, as we know, rely on weapons smuggled into Mexico from the United States. The US can do more to tighten background checks and regulate sales in border states while giving Mexico the technological tools to detect arms crossing the border and trace those used um, for crimes inside the country. And I'll end there uh, and turn it over uh, to the commentator. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mary. Uh, we'll now turn to Alejandro Hope. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, the Wilson Center. Thank you to everyone who set, who set up this this uh, uh, this meeting. Um, I read the report; a lot of interest. I think it's a very, very good uh, uh, piece of uh, analytical um, uh, of, uh, analysis about the, the the challenges and changes facing counter narcotics policy in the U.S and how that might impact uh, Latin America in general, Mexico in particular. Um, let me just try to, I'm going to try to talk about some of the changes in the Mexican uh, counter narcotics landscape over the past decade, uh, how it has changed from, um, in terms of the underlying phenomenon, how it has, has changed in terms of policy um, to set up a discussion of how we might move forward from here. Um, some of these themes are covered in the report, um, but uh, I think they bear, they bear some, some uh, uh, insistence. One that I think is very important, something that has changed in Mexico very significantly over the past decade is that uh, in terms of drug production, we have, we have shifted increasingly from uh, plant-based uh, uh, substances to synthetic substances. Uh, the century-old marijuana trade, Mexico, U.S.-Mexico trade has probably, if not uh, disappeared, has certainly declined. Uh, eradication uh, of uh, marijuana fields has gone down, gone down something like 80% over the past decade. Uh, uh, seizures of marijuana has all declined, also with, both within Mexico and at the border. Um, and uh, there is now probably evidence that, uh, at least in terms of value, um, there might be more marijuana imports from the US into Mexico than the, than the reverse. reverse. Um, that is why, because mostly because of uh, May one legalization uh, on at the state level in the U.S. that has significantly changed the game uh, in terms of what used to be the main one of the mainstays of the U.S. Uh, of Mexico drug trade. Likewise for for uh, poppy uh, and for heroin, um, what you have seen over the past three years, and this is something that the drug crisis group has uh, documented uh, repeatedly, is we have seen a decline in uh, a, a maybe even a collapse in the price of opium gum and, and heroin within Mexico, mostly driven by the substitution of, of, of heroin by fentanyl in the in US markets. Um, and uh, that is, uh, again, uh, measured by, by, as measured by eradication and measured by, by uh, uh, seizures. Um, heroin is probably, if not on the way out, certainly, certainly down from where it was uh, even a, uh, a few years back. Um, cocaine is probably uh, having ebbs and flows, but certainly no, it's not even not close to where it was um, uh, 12, 15 years ago. And uh, meth, uh, meanwhile, meth has probably uh, increased significant meth exports from Mexico to the US have probably increased significantly over the past uh, decade, even though they're very difficult to estimate. Um, that changes, I mean, that fact, I think, changes or forces a change in, how, in the metrics of success in country narcotics policy. Um, eradication, I think, was never very useful and has probably become now um, almost meaningless. Um, secondly, um, seizures, uh, seizures are, are um, to the extent that we're seeing 
that the drugs that are being trafficked from Mexico to the U.S. are lower volume and uh, high, are high, high value, low volume, particularly fentanyl. Uh, maybe we could, should think of how, how we should uh, use seizures as a measure of success or failure in terms of cardiac explosion. Um, I think that is one very, very important change. Um, secondly, uh, what we're seeing in terms of, of, of uh, trafficking is a much more fragmented landscape than what we saw uh, in, in the first decade of this century, um, at the time when the Merida initiative was launched. Um, at that time, we probably had four, five, six large-scale drug trafficking organizations that were basically involved in, in large-scale op trafficking operations to the U.S. What you have now is a, a large array of criminal groups of uh, diverse uh, sizes and, uh, and activities. Um, some, some are involved in drug trafficking, some are not involved in drug trafficking or, or are an ancillary part or only are play an auxiliary part in the drug trade. Um, of the, the old, there are very few of the old style cartels left. Uh, it's not clear what is left, for instance, of a Sinaloa cartel. The sons of uh, Joaquin Guzman, aka El Chapo, are still uh, are probably still involved in the business. But are they? Is the is a, is it still a hierarchical criminal structure? I'm, I'm I have my doubts. Um, probably the only criminal the only criminal organization that is uh, that is akin to what we used to think as a cartel is the Jalisco New Generation Cartel. Uh, even though it is also a probably a more decentralized organization than what used to be the case in, in the past. And also, and this is something that we have seen uh, in, during the pandemic, is that a large portion of, of traffic, uh, trafficking has become more decentralized and some of it has gone online. Um, some uh, some uh, operations are now, some transactions are now done online and payment is done through cryptocurrency, of course, um, which makes this, uh, again, much more difficult to track and much more difficult to measure success against. Um, that is, I think, uh, some of the big changes in terms of the landscape. Let me try to describe some of what I think are the big changes in terms of policy. Um, when media started around 2007-2008, that, that's also the, the, when the Mexican government starts using the military much more intensively, but it was seen, I mean, this use of the military as a law enforcement tool, as a tool uh, in the fight against uh, criminal organizations, was seen as a temporary uh, measure while police capabilities were, were built. In the current administration, I mean, they decided that there, there is no, no longer, that's no longer to be a temporary measure, that they're going to use the military permanently as a tool, uh, as, a, as a tool of law, in law enforcement, that it's going to, the military are going to be the key law enforcement institution in Mexico. Um, and that is, that is a permanent change. The so-called National Guard is basically an extension of the armed forces in a different ministry. 80, almost 70, almost 80% of its members are active military uh, uh, personnel. And there is really no, no reason and there is no incentive for, uh, for, the, for the government to transfer them into, into permanently into the National Guard. And uh, along with that, the military have been gaining authority in other areas that are not necessarily connected to security and not necessarily connected to uh, um, uh, connected to uh, counter narcotics um, and the political position of the, of the military has strengthened significantly over the past two or three years and uh, that will probably reduce incentives to incentives to build uh, civilian uh, law enforcement institutions. Um, also, some of the pillars, some of the, the traditional pillars of uh, U.S.-Mexico cooperation in terms of uh, uh, drug trade have, um, if not disappeared, have probably declined in importance. Um, the king, the so-called kingpin strategy, going after the heads of, of major drug trafficking organizations, 
uh, which was um, uh, one of the key components of, of Merida, one of the key components of, of the US-Mexico cooperation for even way before Merida, um, probably has its importance has, has declined. The current administration has uh, expressly stated that going after Kingpins is not their priority. Um, and there are not that many campaigns out there anyway. Um, and uh, the wisdom of going after campaigns has been questioned um, repeatedly because of it, it, the destabilizing effect it can have in, in, terms, in terms of criminal violence. Also, more generally, I think cooperation, security cooperation with the US um, has, is in, in a process of, uh, of erosion. Uh, it began under the Trump administration, but will probably continue under the current administration. Um, the Trump administration was mostly mo mostly interested uh, or fundamentally interested in stopping migration flows. And in to that regard, the Mexican government was willing to uh, to play ball on the in that in that area. But in terms of a broader media like uh, arc uh, corporation architecture, I think the the game has changed significantly. Um, uh, the current, again, the current of the president of Mexico has repeatedly stated that he doesn't care about the media initiative and he wants to re uh, set the cooperation with the US. Um, the Cienfuegos uh, in Broglio um, has um, created a uh, a very bad precedent in terms of uh, a cooperation between the, the two countries. Already the Mexican military, particularly the Mexican army, had a lot of suspicion, um, uh, did, uh, had a lot of suspicion vis-a-vis -vis the DEA. That is likely to increase after what happened over the past few months. Um, and uh, the Mexican government has already started to limit or try to limit the presence of um, so-called foreign agents in, in Mexican territory. They passed a reform to the national security law late last year, um, forcing or uh, so-called foreign agents, i.e. agents from of the DEA, FBI, ICE, whatever, uh, to register with the Mexican government pro and provide uh, information to a Mexican government, whatever, or whatever, info, or whatever uh, their enforcers are telling them. Um, that is, I mean, that is what could, could create a lot of friction between the two governments, or it could create a, a, a situation where some forms of cooperation, I'm thinking fusion centers, I'm thinking um, joint operations are going to be very, very difficult under that legal, uh, under uh, that legal framework. Um, and finally, and I'm going to stop with this, I think in Mexico, momentum for broad-based institutional reform has stalled. Um, the current attorney general, uh, the current, uh, who is the first autonomous attorney general, uh, or allegedly autonomous attorney general in Mexico, uh, uh, Fiscal Alejandro Gertz, um, is clearly opposed to the uh, criminal justice reform of 2008. Has stated it repeatedly, has stated it explicitly, uh, tried to pass a counter reform last year, might, might try to pass it again at some point uh, in, in the future. Um, he wants to, uh, he's, why doesn't he like the, uh, the criminal justice reform, doesn't it? Because it reduces the power of the, uh, 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 prosecutors and particularly of the, the uh, federal attorney general's office. And he wants to return to the old system where <coughs> the so-called the Ministerio Publico was um, uh, at the, the core of, of the criminal justice system. Uh, and also efforts to reform local and state uh, and, and, and state police forces, which is, are the core of Mexican law enforcement capabilities, um, has also stalled. Uh, there is a clearly a centralizing tendencies in the current administration. Uh, some of the funds devoted for, for uh, institutional reform, for uh, police reform at the local level uh, have been eliminated, but there's particularly one specific fund called Fortase, in, in, in 
current in the current budget and that is likely there is no real champion of institutional reform at the national level uh, at the national level. the priority of the current administration is building federal capabilities and federal capabilities built on the on, on the armed forces um and every anything else is i mean is a of secondary interest to the current research so again that that has been the core of, of, of uh, the media initial core of the past since 2011-2012 that is an area that the Mexican government doesn't really care about right now so um, I think we, there is a, there is a really a need to rethink re uh, U.S. Mexico security cooperation uh, considering the change the political changes in Mexico over the past two or three years uh, I think some of the of our, the thinking on both sides of the border is, is still um, is still stuck in the situation that prevailed for 2018 in, in Mexico, and I think there's 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 a need to uh, uh, to uh, revise and review how things have changed and how things will change over the next uh, few years. Thank you very much. Alejandro, thank you for that sobering assessment. Um, Daniel Mejia, thank you for joining us from Colombia. Thank you, thank you. First of all, thank you. Uh, Cindy and Andrew for inviting me to the Wilson Center. Uh, it's a pleasure to, 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 to provide some comments on the, on the, on the report. Um, and it's a pleasure to share this panel with uh, General Fraser, Mary and, and Alejandro, whom I haven't seen in a long time. So it's a pleasure to see you again, Alejandro. Um, first of all, I'm gonna refer to, the, to, to some general points of the report, which I think comes uh, very timely in, in, in a time when the when the when there is a recent change in the in the in the U.S. administration, uh, which I think will will pay a lot more attention to the report than the than the previous administration would, so it's uh, it's very timely, I think, um, and that will change the landscape of the dialogue between um, Latin American countries and the U.S. government regarding uh, anti-drug strategies and drug policy in general. So. I think it's a very timely report. It's a comprehensive report that takes into account many, many of the many of the institutional constraints, the political constraints, and uh, one of the things I liked the most about the report was the the call for uh, for something that has become a cliche, which is uh, evidence-based policy making. I think I think uh, calling ONDCP to to promote and implement anti-drug strategies that at least have some evidence that have worked. And 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 are cost effective. Uh, it's very important because that sometimes we we stop uh, we 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 don't listen to, uh, that much to to those arguments of of evidence based uh, drug policies, which which I think is going to come later in my comments. Um, referring to the to the to the Colombian part of the report, I think as I said, it's very comprehensive with all the menu or the options of, 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 of anti-drug strategies that have been implemented in Colombia. Uh, when Plan Colombia, which is basically the, the starting point of the, of the, of the, of the anti-drug strategies and, uh, and joint uh, efforts between Colombia and the US to fight against the illicit uh, narcotics production, uh, had two main objectives, which was, and, I, and, 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 and this is something I liked about the report, which which comes at the very start of the report, which is I think Plan Colombia was a ver very successful as a as a counterinsurgency strategy and as a violence reduction strategy because it uh, in a sense that the, the Plan Colombia provided the funds for the military forces and the police uh, to fight against the criminal organizations and and that allowed the Colombian the Colombian armed forces and the police. To, to really attack the, the sources of violence in Colombia. So from the Colombian point of view, I think Plan Colombia and most of the analysts in, analysts in Colombia agree with this, uh, was very successful in terms of reducing violence in Colombia and providing the armed forces uh, with training programs, with the, with the, with, uh, with the resources needed to, to fight against the uh, criminal organizations. And the report also says something that I agree with uh, that the that in terms of drug reduction as a drug reduction strategy as a drug supply reduction strategy, uh, the report 
is uh, calls it a, a failure. I think it is in this, in not, not in the sense of, of actually not having achieved any goals, but in the sense of, of, uh, of having put the, the focus of the anti-drug strategy in the parts of the production and trafficking change, uh, uh, chain that uh, made it very cost ineffective. And this is the uh, attacking the, the coca crops and not the really important parts of the drug trafficking and the drug production and trafficking chain. Uh, I've done a lot of research on, 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 on trying, to, uh, trying to evaluate the, the cost effectiveness of different anti-drug strategies. And what comes out of that research and research, research done by, by many people in, the, in Colombia and abroad is that uh, any type of and, and, and this is something I, dis I disagree in practice, not in theory with the report. Any policy aimed at reducing drug production and trafficking by attacking illicit crops is a failure. And especially the aerial spraying program and the manual eradication program are failures, are very cost, in cost uh, ineffective. Um, uh, let, let me give you a, a few a few a few a few numbers. This total cost to the U.S. And, uh, of of destroying a, a, a hectare of, of planted with coca leaf is between sixty two and one hundred thousand dollars. Between sixty two thousand dollars and one hundred thousand dollars. Whereas the value of that, the market value of that the, of the coca leaf planted in a, in one hectare of land. Uh, at one point in time is around 400 to 500 dollars so it's it's very cost ineffective to attack coca crops because growers re, uh, are able to replant very quickly and uh, and that's that hasn't worked in a sense what, what i'm saying is that destroying one hectare of land by manual eradication or aerial spraying uh, is is very costly to the us and colombia is very costly in terms of lives of eradicate of manual eradicators is very costly in terms of health outcomes of the of the populations exposed to the to the aerial spraying program. Is very costly in terms of, uh, and it's not an effective strategy in actually reducing the amount of cocaine flowing out of Colombia. So that 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 comes out in many uh, research papers. Some of uh, some of some done by me and co-authors, but uh, there are many papers actually now showing that the aerial spraying program is not cost effective. If you add to that all the human right concerns about the aerial spraying program, that's that's not very cost effective. So it's it's in a sense uh, surprising that the Colombian government, the current Colombian government, is still insisting in re, in in starting again the aerial spraying program, despite the the constitutional court decision to uh, call the government to to. To comply with some things that they have to, they supposedly have to comply with to, to restart the aerial spraying program. So that's that's a complete that, that's a complete uh, mistake uh, that is uh, now being uh, proposed by the government. I disagree with that. On the other hand, there are there is that's the that's the sticks: uh, manual eradication, aerial spraying, the carrots, which is the alternative development programs, with the exception of what Mary what Mary. Uh, Remember that uh, the Macarena Consolidation Plan. Most of the most of the of the alternative developing programs that have been have been implemented in Colombia have not been successful in actually sustaining and promoting in the long term legal activities. And that's because this is these are very isolated areas where farmers actually have the initial resources to replant legal crops. And substitute them for, for for illegal crops, but they cannot sustain that business. It's unsustainable financially, unsustainable, and the government cannot can, just cannot uh, sustain that over the long term. So I agree with the report uh, recommendation and, and 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 vision of the of the of the substitution programs that in theory should work, but in practice they don't work because they these alternative development programs at this this is where where the where the Macarena Consolidation Plan, com plan comes to, to the discussion, uh, for these alternative development programs to work, they have to be very comprehensive. It's not just a matter of, just give, of, of giving financial resources or crop substitution programs to farmers who cultivate illegal crops. They have to, uh, these plans have to be accompanied, uh, 
come, they have to come with uh, the construction of roads, the presence of police, the presence of, the, of judges and, and, and attorneys, uh, the presence of more schools. Otherwise, they just don't work. Unfortunately, this is in practice, not in theory. In theory, it sounds perfect. They sound perfect, but, it, but they don't work in practice, with the exception of the Macarena Consolidation Plan, which was very successful. We have an evaluation of the Macarena Consolidation Plan. It was very successful for three years. And uh, when the Colombian government uh, made the, mistake, the previous government, the, the Santos administration, uh, made the mistake of replacing the head of that program who was who was an expert on this on these types of programs with a politician, the, the program just uh, ended. Uh, that's the part of the of the of the many of options that the Colombian government has implemented to fight against illegal crops, which which has been for the last 20 or 30 years, the focus of the Colombian anti-drug strategy, attack illicit crops. When we look at other options, at, at other options in the menu of, of, of options, we have interdiction, which is going after the drug, the drug producing labs, going after large drug shipments, uh, and going after the routes used to transport illicit uh, shipments of, of, of cocaine. That has been, in my view, that has been very successful. There are no human rights concern. It's a cost-effective strategy, and Colombia actually did this in the uh, when when uh, in the uh, Uribe administration when president, former President Santos was the Minister of Defense. Uh, between 2007 and 2009, Colombia reduced aerial spraying, reduced manual eradication actually re ended the, the Macarena Consolidation Plan, which was, which was a mistake, but increased significantly the destruction of cocaine producing labs and increased substantially the interdiction of large drug shipments. Between those two years, between 2007 and 2009, the net supply of cocaine going out of Colombia, that is the, the supply of cocaine minus interdiction inside Colombia went down by 50%. And drug prices at retail, and wholesale in the US, the cocaine price at retail at the retail level and the wholesale level by which I think in a sense, uh, it's, it can be measured as something successful. It reduced the, the supply and it, 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 it had the counterpart of, of, incre of significant increasing drug prices in the, in the US. Someone can argue that increasing prices may induce more people to, to get into the business and made the, the business most, more profitable and in the long term it, it, it wouldn't be sustainable, but that, that has to come at a cost, I think. Um, and something that the report, at the end of the report is very important. There is another option of a, that has not been implemented as much at, as it should in Colombia, which is anti-money laundering strategies. And I'm sorry, I, I don't know the exact translation if Cindy can help me with this. Um, uh, extinción de dominio, uh, asset for feature, I think it is. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Okay. These are, two, these are two tools that the Colombian law has, but they are extremely difficult to implement. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I joined the, the Bogota administration as secretary of security for two and a half years, it was, although we had all the legal tools to uh, go after the assets of minor drug traffickers in, in Bogota. Imagine that, 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 that at a large scale at the national level, it was almost impossible to forfeit the assets of, 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 of minor drug traffickers in, in Bogota. Imagine that, uh, trying to do that at a large scale with drug trafficking organizations. So in a sense, if I, I, I'm, when, when, when I'm asked about this, I, I say that my, my, my response is that one of the things that Colombia should do is to put a lot more emphasis on a, um, a strengthening the two government institutions that, that are in charge money laundering and asset for feature of a, coming out of, illicit, of the illicit drug trade. And I think that really, if, if, we, if the aim is to reduce violence and reduce the, how profitable it is uh, drug trafficking, you have to go after the assets. You, you don't have to go after the coca crops, which are the very initial stage of the production process, which have, has almost no value added at that, at that time in the, in the production and trafficking chain. So I think it's a, 
we need to call for, and I think I like that about the report it, in the in the final. I think it's one of the final chapters. Uh, we have to we have to. I think, and I think this is something where the U.S. can can actually uh, promote a lot more cooperation with with governments like Colombia, Mexico, Central America, which is, for instance, with the with all these tools that we have, analytical tools, uh, machine learning tools, etc. We have we we need to strengthen those tools. I think in Mexico, in Colombia, countries that have the, enough data to actually uh, identify atypical transactions and actually go after the 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 real the parts of the chain that have the high value added in that in that business. If we continue going after the after the coca crops, we're gonna we're gonna continue as President Santos once called it the a static bicycle, bicycle, which is we can do many things. We can show that we are spraying a lot of hectares of land with with a, with glyphosate. We can show that we are eradicating a lot of coca crops, but we're not gonna be a, actually reducing the flow of cocaine and reduce the the, the illicit. A, flows of financial resources of, 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 farm, of farm groups. I think in Colombia, uh, I don't know if Alejandro agrees with this, and, and I don't think that's the case in Mexico. Colombia production and trafficking has become less violent, and this is a success of Plan Colombia. Uh, actually, sending a signal that this is something Mark, Mark Clayman, who died a few years ago, uh, emphasized a lot, which is try to create incentives so that drug traffickers are less violent. If we cannot solve that part of the problem, at least make it, make it less violent. And I think that that was a real success in Colombia. If you objectively look at the data of violence indicators in Colombia, most of them have gone down dramatically. The homicide rate, extortion, kidnappings, terrorist attacks, etc. So I think that's something that, that we have to learn how Colombia did this to actually promote this in other in other countries in the region. Let me stop here and, and, and continue with the debate and, and take some questions. Great, thanks, Daniel. Um, if uh, people who are listening to the webinar want to send a question, please remember to do that via our Twitter account, at LATAMPROGUE. We have a couple of questions, but first I'd like to turn to Andrew Rudman, director of the Mexico Institute, to ask the first uh, question of the panelists. Thanks. Thanks, Cindy, and, and thanks to all the, the panelists. Really uh, fantastic presentations and analysis. And, and I, I suspect, like many of you, I, I have numerous questions in my head, uh, but I'll try to limit myself to one at least, at least to start. Um, the report uh, suggests that uh, cooperation between the US and, and host government should be handled through uh, negotiation of compacts similar to the Millennium Challenge Corporation. So that would be negotiations essentially between the US Embassy and the host government, if I'm, if I'm not oversimplifying or, or mischaracterizing. So I wonder, Alejandro, uh, as you noted, President Lopez Obrador is not terribly supportive, I think to put it mildly, of the Merida Initiative and has perhaps expressed not as much interest in cooperation and certainly in financial support, maybe not in cooperation uh, with the USG. Um, what are your thoughts on, on how the AMLO administration might react to this idea of, of negotiating a, a cooperative, a, a compact for cooperation? And, and maybe as a, a follow on to that question, we're, there will be a new US ambassador at some point in Mexico. What would you suggest that he, that, that she do to implement uh, that sort of negotiation. Alejandro, you're still I'm muted. Here. There you yeah, go. I think that's the phrase of the pandemic. The, the plague, uh, the plague of, of the of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Indeed, I think we, there needs to be a reframing of Merida considering the changed political circumstances in, in Mexico. That hasn't really happened. Um, there has, under, under the Trump administration, I mean, there was some effort to recreate a high level working group with, with Mexico. They're still meeting. Uh, my guess is um, those meetings have become ever less effective over the past six months or so. 
Um, and again, um, the Cienfuegos um, incident probably didn't help. Um, my guess is that if the U.S. wants to engage with the Lopez Obrador um, uh, administration, they probably need to reframe cooperation in terms that might prove more amenable, amenable to, to the administration, probably put more emphasis on social development, uh, probably on economic assistance, uh, less so on um, on, on a strictly uh, on a strictly security concerns. Um, I try to create at least um, some some path to uh, reestablishing some level of confidence with the armed forces, which are the key, particularly the army, which are the, I think the key actor in defining security policy in Mexico right now. Um, there might be uh, under in, at SRE at the uh, foreign ministry, there might be some at least uh, some openness to a reframing uh, uh, the relationship. Um, I think the, the the name should be dropped. I mean, maybe the initiative has uh, clear, uh, very clear uh, Calderonista uh, on the uh, 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 look and feel. So, it should, I mean, this should be, uh, I mean, let me put it this way. Um, AMLO was a clear opponent of NAFTA for most of his career. Uh, so now uh, Trump comes in, decides to re to renegotiate uh, the deal. Now it's not called NAFTA, and now it's called USMCA. It's a similar thing. It's a similar, a similar thing, but it has been rebranded. Uh, I think a similar thing should be done with, with, with media. It's no longer the media, it's whatever. Um, it's whatever and uh, put more emphasis on some of the things that, some of the themes that, that the current administration is, uh, pro will probably react positively to. And then um, I'm thinking um, economic assistance, social development, things of that nature. Um, but again, I wouldn't be very, very optimistic that there will be um, very close cooperation uh, with the U.S. in, in at least a couple of years. I have a, a couple of questions for, for Danielle. Um, one is that uh, coca production during the Uribe administration did fall quite dramatically. Um, with a little bit of a blip in, in 2008, 2009, one can argue, as you have and others have, that it was not sustainable because it was simply a, um, a, a, a policy of, of, uh, of repression of crops um, and not enough investment in, in alternative, in sustainable alternative development. But when you, when you mention um, going after the higher value uh, components of the drug trafficking chain, the more lucrative parts of it, um, are you suggesting that coca production should just be allowed to, you know, increase if not explode? In the words of uh, of people uh, before the beginning of of Plan Colombia. And second, I'm I'm curious about the um, the statement you made that that violence overall has gone down because if anything, it seems like along the drug trafficking routes in border areas on the Pacific coast, um, the violence is at least stable, if not mm -hmm. greater, as these different criminal groups um, fight for control of territory and, and, uh, and, and control um, of areas that, you know, in some cases had previously been occupied by the FARC. So I um, just comment on that, and then we'll turn to some of the questions that have come to us uh, from the audience. Thank you, Cindy. So I'm, I'm going to start with the first with the first part. It is, tr it is true that when Plan Colombia started in 2000, 2001, uh, and the aerial spraying program was launched, uh, coca production, coca cultivation went down significantly from 163,000 hectares to something around 60,000 hectares, 60,000 hectares uh, within a period of just uh, six years. But if you look at how many kilograms of, of pure cocaine Purity, with purity at the at, at 92 percent, which is the purity that they can achieve in, in a lab in Colombia. A purity increased from 4.7 kilograms per hectare of land per year to 7.2 kilograms of uh, of uh, of cocaine per hectare of land with coca crops. So actually, there there was some technological improvements, 
in response to the aerial spraying program, which, which uh, made drug traffickers use more efficiently that factor of production, which was becoming scarce due to the aerial spraying program. So they adapted and they not only adapted by actually increasing productivity, but they also adapted by, re, by uh, using techniques such as replanting or spraying molasses over the coca crops to, to actually uh, uh, prevent the parasite from the... So they adapted and quickly after 2005, 2006, coca cultivation started increasing again. again. Uh, so I think I think the the the, the defendants of uh, of of the aerial spraying program uh, actually used that argument that coca cultivation went down significantly uh, in the in the first six years of Plant Colombia when 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 spraying was going up, but they don't use the metric of uh, the amount of cocaine that was going out of Colombia, potential cocaine production minus seizures, uh, and that that didn't decrease that much. Uh, whereas, as I mentioned in my previous intervention. Whereas uh, between 2007 and 2009, when the aerial spring program was going down, manner eradication was going down, but interdiction was going up, the net supply of cocaine going out of Colombia went down by 50%. That, uh, that I would call it a success in terms of reducing the, uh, the, the illicit flows of cocaine to the US and the illicit financial resources coming to criminal groups in Colombia. So, so I think, I think I think we have, and, 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 and my, I think we all have to, to, to admit that we have to, we have put too much emphasis on looking at the metric. And this is something the commission does very well, which is we have to revise the metrics with which we measure success in the anti-narcotic strategies of the US in Latin America and of the anti-drug strategies that uh, Latin American countries are doing. I think we have to, we, have, we uh, and, and, and I mean the governments, the analysts, the researchers, et cetera, have to put, have put too much emphasis on, look, on, on looking at the only outcome of the, of the anti-narcotic anti strategies of coca crops. And I think that's a mistake, but that's because that's the very initial stage of, of producing cocaine and sending it to the US or to Europe or other countries in the world. I agree, Cindy, with your second point. And I think it's a caveat that, that, that we should emphasize more. Uh, in general, violence in Colombia has gone down, but it's preoccupying uh, the, it's worrisome, sorry, the, the, the figures that we are seeing in, in cities such as Buenaventura, Tumaco, and, and, and trafficking routes, where violence is actually going up, and where social leaders and human rights uh, leaders uh, are being killed, some of them because they are opposing they are opposed to alternative development programs being implemented as a, as a, as a strategy to fight against illegal crops. So I, I, I agree with you and, 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 I, and, and we should, we should in, in addition to saying that in general, violence in Colombia has gone down, uh, we have to worry, and I think the Colombian government is doing that right. We have to worry about the killing of social leaders, of uh, human rights uh, leaders, uh, that are opposing uh, the alternative development programs that are being are being are trying to be implemented in the in the Pedet in the Pedet regions in Colombia. So, and I think the Colombian government is doing all that it can to to protect those so, those the social leaders that are that are that are trying to implement those those programs. And 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 it's right that not not in all regions in Colombia violence has gone down. Andrew, uh, you're sure. Mute. Thanks. Thanks. Um, thanks. Let, let's shift gears a, a little bit um, and uh, focus back on the report a bit. Um, and, and let me pose a question we, we received uh, through the through Twitter uh, to General Frazier and, and perhaps to Mary as well. In that the report uh, talks about a number of changes that ought to be made, uh, but doesn't really seem to be making a, a ma recommendation for a major change in how we approach drug control. It's more of a do what you were doing better approach. Uh, at least that's the that's one way to describe it. I wonder if you have a, if you could talk a little bit about if there was any thought at, at sort of a deeper uh, or broader reconfiguration of our, our drug strategy in, in preparation of the report. So let, let me start. 
in answering that, I think the commission had a fairly robust discussion on this topic, uh, if you will. And I think we, we fell back to what I was discussing earlier and what we've heard throughout this discussion. And that is there's always an adjusting uh, situation and environment we face as we look at drug policy. Uh, and therefore our look was uh, as we look through what uh, the US and other governments have been doing, there have been adaptations within policy, within programs to match that. I guess from our standpoint, it was a little more federated than, than we would like. Um, and so not as coordinated, not as focused. And so uh, a lot of our conversation then went to, if we make a recommendation on a policy change, okay, but it will be 10 years or 20 years before the next commission. So is that really going to be a policy shift that will sustain the test of time? And, and so our focus became, I think, more on looking at the organization part of the US and, and the relationship with partner nations to figure out how to give them, those organizations, the flexibility and adaptability to meet the changes in the environment as they happen. And so that's why the report really focuses more on that part of it and I think also recognizes that there have been changes and that they've been good changes and that those need to continue. Great. Thanks. Um, there are two questions about uh, money laundering, which I guess would be uh, questions for any of you. The first is from Sarah Sigrist, who is a lawyer at the World Bank, and she asks, what are the barriers and what tools would be needed for successful efforts in anti-money laundering and asset forfeiture in Colombia? And then the second question along those same lines from Eric Sterling, the former uh, executive director of the Criminal Justice Policy Foundation, for money laundering, and this is probably for Danielle, the economist, for money laundering and asset forfeiture to meaningfully impact the cocaine market, what percent of financial flows or profits needs to be seized? In other words, what level is more significant than an expense like a sales tax? So let's take those two questions about money laundering. Should I start, Cindy, maybe? Please. I think, I think the constraints are uh, international cooperation between countries to share information regarding uh, financial flows. Um, uh, and I think having solved that problem, uh, and, and, I, and I heard that I, I, I have heard that this is a real problem that the sharing of information of some of some countries with Colombia regarding movements of, of assets and financial flows uh, uh, between countries. Uh, if we manage to solve that that problem, we should train. I, I, and this is something that I've been trying to. More recently, we should strengthen the capacities and the, the of the of, 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 of some Colombian institutions, especially uh, WIAF, which is an intelligence unit uh, that is supposed to be working with uh, the general attorney's office to uh, identify uh, strange movements of assets uh, for all transactions in Colombia. Uh, and 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 just to give you a number. The number of reports of of, of strange report of, of reports of a strange uh, uh, movements of assets that were sent to the general attorney's office uh, two years ago was less than one hundred total reports. So that's 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 nothing compared to the amount of illicit of the illicit transactions that are being done in Colombia every day. Uh, that are linked to, to drug trafficking uh, activities. So I think we should we should actually improve the capacities of the WIAF and the and the and the uh, asset for feature of uh, unit in Colombia to actually be able to 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 have to have some impact on 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 illicit transaction uh, on illicit transactions uh, linked to drug trafficking, of course. The second question is more difficult to answer. What's the per, what's the percentage of the of the financial flows that we should be able to 
to um, observe or or seize is difficult to say, but I think I think we are in Colombia. We are actually if 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 I'm, if I'm asked what's what's the what's the amount what's the fraction of the assets that have been counterfeited by the Colombian government uh, linked to drug traffickers is less than five or ten percent, uh, which is nothing. So basically, they pay time in jail or they are killed, but they continue with the with the with the with the with the assets that they have been able to to make out of the drug trafficking business and. And they they have said that in in many interviews, most of the of the Colombian drug traffickers that have been interviewed and have been asked about this, they are they don't they they take it they, they take into account the cost of paying time in jail, but as long as they they continue having control over the assets that they have been able to make out of the of the of the drug trafficking business, uh, and their families can can actually uh, uh, still sustain that. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, we uh, we have a question, uh, really, I think, aimed at, at Alejandro uh, from Richard Brown, who's the Gray Fellow for International Reporting at Columbia University. Uh, and Richard asks, would international legalization and regulation of cocaine be likely to reduce or increase drug-related violence in Mexico? Uh, what would be the impact on, on police corruption. And, and Alejandro, if I can, with, with Richard's indulgence, I would um, toss the impact of likely re, uh, legalization of cannabis for recreational use in Mexico into that mix as well. And Alejandro, before, before you go ahead, I want to um, throw in another question along those same lines um, from Greg Green at the uh, U.S. Embassy in Santiago, um, which asks, can we simply pharmaceuticalized cocaine via government controlled production. So users re receive a regulated non-fentanyl laced supply, then add individualized drug demand reduction programs, um, and then transnational criminal organization drug profits disappear, as does the violence and corruption involved in the supply chain, which is at a greater savings uh, to U.S. counter-narcotics policy. So a related question probably for all of you um, in terms of harm reduction, which is, you know, a theme that's been out there um, in, uh, in the drug strategy debate for a long time and is certainly taken up in the report, um, you know, whether you can um, find a way to give these uh, uh, controlled doses um, so that you take the profits out. So some big, big questions on the on the table. Okay, okay, legalization. Uh, okay, in general, yes, to the extent that you reduce the size of a of an illicit market, uh, you reduce the level of violence associated with that illicit market. Uh, how much? Well, it depends only on the characteristics of the illicit market in question and uh, the of uh, the the context about uh, 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 the context uh, about that market and the state that <clears throat> the state. Um, let me put it: uh, marijuana legalization has in the U.S. or or at least partial marijuana legalization in the U.S. has. We have there a practical case of what would happen. Uh, what would happen in in source countries? Uh, this particularly in Mexico. What we have seen, as I said before, you have probably seen a significant decline, quite a significant decline in the size of Mexican marijuana exports to the US as measured by eradication, as measured by seizures within Mexico, as measured by seizures at the US-Mexico border. Um, however, I mean, and, and, and uh, you look, just looking at eradication, uh, at the uh, radiation metric, it has probably gone down 80, 80 to 90 percent over the past decade. Um, has that led to a reduction of violence? Not quite. At least, let me put it, not not visible at the at the national level. Probably visible at local in communities that produce marijuana. There's a recent paper that um, seems uh, seems to find a relationship between uh, 
state level legalization, uh, marijuana legalization in the US and reduction of homicides in Mexico, but only in marijuana producing communities. So that is likely to, whatever happens, so whatever happens in Mexico this year, Mexico needs, has a, there's a, a mandate from the Supreme Court to the Mexican Congress to legislate on, on, on my, my cannabis uh, legalization. It will probably happen in April. But I mean, the, the impact, uh, whatever impact we have seen uh, is, uh, is probably already a big thing. Um, cocaine, sure. Would cocaine have a, a bigger impact on uh, could, uh, the creation of a legal cocaine market uh, legal regulated cocaine might have an impact on violence in countries that are um, in producing and tra transit countries. Yes. But well, is it likely to happen? No. Uh, Any time to think, think of, or at least not in the in the foreseeable future. Um, think of what has happened with my. Think of the timeline in terms of marijuana. The first state that legalized for recreational uh, for uh, recreational. Um, purposes was Colorado, Washington, 2012. We're almost a decade in, and uh, there hasn't even been federal legalization of marijuana in the US. So, and, and marijuana is the easy case. Politically, it's the easy case. Uh, so, yeah, sure. Uh, but I, I think that, that is, it is more of a, right now, a more of an academic discussion than a real, it's not really in the policy, in, in, in the policy sphere. Um, and finally, on, on this, I think the opioid crisis in the US uh, should remind, um, should remind observers and analysts of, of drug markets that you can have really large illegal markets or legal substances. Uh, the opioid, the first part of the opioid crisis in the U.S. was with OxyContin, was with pharmaceuticals, um, and uh, it was the second. The second portion was and was when heroin, particularly Mexican heroin, it started substituting for those those uh, um, opioids and uh, pharmaceutical opioids in, in, in the U.S. prescription drugs. And the third, think of the third part of the, of the crisis, which is fentanyl substituting heroin. Fentanyl is, you should, people should be reminded of this, fentanyl is a legal substance. It is used in a clinical environment. Uh, but you have a very, very large illegal market of a legal substance. So um, just, I mean, this should, be a reminder that regulating that regulating um, uh, substances is a complicated issue. It's not a binary legalization. We should move away from the binary legalization prohibition framework on this discussion. Mary, did you want to say something? Yes, I, I just I want to echo a bit. Uh, Alejandro made the point I, I wanted to make. Yes, we have to realize that legally available substances with a lot of regulation, i.e. pharmaceuticals, are the origin of our current opioid crisis. But also in the case of cocaine, um, remember how cheap and cocaine is to produce. Um, this would be like trying to regulate, um, in fact, worse than trying to regulate sugar. I mean, it's extremely cheap to produce and to manufacture. So you would have to, if you wanted to regulate it and, and even very difficult to create a government monopoly, and then you would have to put prices that are so high um, uh, that, that you would be creating a black market any, anyway. So it, it, it's in theory, it sounds nice. Let's have a government monopoly. And some have proposed that this is what we should do. I think Mark Kleiman was an advocate of having the, the government should supply marijuana because he was concerned about the industrialization and the commercialization of marijuana. Mar cocaine would be even harder because it's so compact, so easy, and so astonishingly cheap to produce. So Cindy, uh, this is Doug Fraser. Let me add just a couple of points if I could. One, I think uh, we traditionally want to find the silver bullet that will solve all our problems for us. There are no silver bullet solutions to this issue, uh, one. 
Two is, I think, as we talk about this, we're focused on it from a drug production and a, a carnal narcotics uh, standpoint. But the second and third order social impacts of legalization also need to be factored into the discussion and not just left uh, on the side. And I think we've seen that in the discussions and the impacts of fentanyl, uh, of um, legal opiates, uh, and we'll see the same uh, continuing. So this is a very complicated uh, arena to deal with. And that's, again, I'll go back to my original point. That's why we focused on having the flexibility and adaptability and policy and funding to address issues as they they arise uh, and not try and find those silver bullets. Thanks. We have just a couple minutes remaining and I would like to uh, address a question probably to General Frazier and to Mary um, from William Vigil, uh, who is co-director of South North Nexus and from Nicaragua. In discussing the Northern Triangle or looking at Central America, did you um, include or you know, think about Nicaragua as well? Um, Transparency International just identified Nicaragua as the most corrupt country in Mesoamerica. Any comment on, on Nicaragua? Uh, what, what I would say is yes, Nicaragua, the entire isthmus uh, comes into play uh, as you look at the topics. Now, from a practical standpoint, I will tell you that we were limited uh, in the time and the focus uh, that we could take. So we targeted areas. And I'll also say that COVID kind of impacted uh, some of our uh, efforts as well. Uh, so Nicaragua is a, a topic of conversation. It needs to be included in the same discussion along with everybody else. We did not focus uh, a tremendous amount of time within the commission on Nicaragua. Mary, any comments? Uh, yeah, we, Nicaragua, also Venezuela, we mentioned Venezuela. Venezuela clearly has a role in, in drug trafficking. Um, it's now a major transshipment point. It's very, and much more than that, there's uh, huge corruption within the Venezuelan government. We mention it. We didn't feel it was within the scope of our mandate to go into detail because there's a lot of policy, other, others focusing on this policy, but we recognize that these um, authoritarian governments, whether it's Venezuela or, or, or Nicaragua, are especially vulnerable to infiltration um, by drug groups. Great. I'd like to perhaps address one last question to each of the panelists. Um, as the report recognizes, in the COVID environment, we're in a resource scarce environment. So if you had one policy recommendation, either for the US government or for the region or for the country that, that you're talking about, if you had one thing that would make uh, a difference, move the needle, um, you know, provide a meaningful change, where would you put those efforts or is it a mistake to think about, you know, just one thing? So who wants to start? Perhaps I'll start. Frazier, yeah, I'll but, start. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not a believer in a single solution. And so I guess the place that I would start and the one thing I would put on the table, and again, the commission had a big discussion on this was the tools on the table need to remain on the table because they can be used at different times for different purposes. Uh, they can be used in conjunction with one another. And I can't tell you when those circumstances are going to rise specifically. Uh, so the tools from eradication to legalization to you name it, I would leave all of them on the table and give the practitioners the latitude to choose the tool that's most effective for the location and the time in which they need to be used. Mary. Well, I would, if reducing it to, to some of the areas where you could perhaps work most productively, the United States should strengthen FinCEN. 
so that it can go after money laundering with the important caveat that we don't even know the exact extent of money laundering. So it's very difficult to know at what point. Um, we don't know the denominators. We don't know how much, we, we know we're, we're dealing with a very minor part of it. We don't know how much it is. Nonetheless, this is an area where we could put more effort. We could use the technological tools that Danielle mentioned, such as artificial intelligence and better algorithms. Um, to detect this money and to go after the people who are benefiting most from drug trafficking. In Colombia, I think the pedets are worth investing in, even if it means being even more selective and creating pilot programs that you can then build out from. But um, let's look at the, I think just in humanitarian terms, you have to go to the people who are suffering most from, these, um, from the drug trade, and that's um, in these poor, historically violent areas. And in Mexico, although Alejandro paints a, a dismal picture um, and I don't hold out much hope for criminal justice reform, I don't see how Mexico can make any progress unless it goes after impunity and goes after the corruption that AMLO himself says uh, within security forces um, uh, that AMLO himself says he's so concerned about. So that should be on the table, even if it's going to be extremely difficult. Alejandro. Uh, okay, I think it's crucial to change the metrics. How uh, it's crucial how uh, we change how we measure success and failure in this area. Um, some of the traditional metrics are increasingly meaningless: um, eradication, seizures, etc. We need to focus less on volume of drugs and more on harms connected to the drug trade. Um, and that includes violence, that includes overdoses, that includes um, the end result uh, and, and not necessarily the process, which has been the mainstay of counter narcotics policy for many decades. Um, and finally, uh, if particularly in the case of Mexico, I think there is an opportunity for local, locally, uh, uh, in, in a local initiatives for police reform, I think there are some 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 municipalities, some states that are doing good work in terms of transforming their law enforcement institutions. I think they should find more support than they have. Um, they should have find more support from inter the international community, particularly from the U.S. government, than they have in the past. Uh, other than that, it's going to be a long, slow, and long, and it's going to be um, some. So I think some difficult years are, are ahead. Not quick enough with my mouse. Danielle, you have the final word. So I agree. I agree with General Fraser that all the tools should remain on the table on the menu of options. But the choice of the tools that we're going to use, and I, 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 this is one of the things I like the most about the report, should be based on the evidence that we have on the on how well those tools work, and how cost effective are those tools used uh, to reduce the problems, to reduce violence, to reduce harms, to reduce drug consumption, etc. Uh, and for the, if, if, I, if, if that is the case, I think I would tell the Colombian government not to insist anymore on the aerial spraying program. I think it's, it's, a, it's a mistake. It's a mistake from a human rights per perspective, from an, from, a, from an efficiency perspective, uh, from our counter narcotic strategy perspective, et cetera. We have all the research, we have many papers saying that that doesn't work and the Colombian government is still insisting in, 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 in using again that tool that uh, has been shown to not work. Uh, so that's, that's my, my, my final point. Thank you all very much. Regrettably, uh, we have run out of time. I, I think, uh, as is often the case, we could we could talk for much longer, uh, but we'll bring it to a close this morning. At, at this time, I want to thank General Frazier, Mary Speck, Danielle Londonio, and Alejandro Ope for participating this morning, really sharing with us some, some provocative and interesting thoughts. And thank all of you for joining us this morning. <laughs>